Okay, Nietzsche, Nietzsche, Nietzsche. What we'll do today is begin by uh, introducing Nietzsche generally, and then we will get into the text at hand, which is on the genealogy of morals. Right. So, Nietzsche lived um, between 1844 and 1900, and uh, behind me here, um, I have several of Nietzsche's most well-known concepts and uh, phrases, right? and that will be our introduction to Nietzsche. Um, you may be familiar with all of these concepts, um, which were the most famous of Nietzsche's, starting with, um, from Nietzsche's Twilight of the Idols, uh, the statement, whatever doesn't kill me, makes me stronger. Right? So now you know that's from Nietzsche, Twilight of the Idols. Um, actually, coincidentally, the same year that uh, this, this on the genealogy of morals was published, um, Twilight of the Idols was published as well. So, if it comes up on Jeopardy, you've got the answer now. Now, um, Nietzsche was an interesting figure insofar as he wanted to question just about everything in the history of Western philosophy, starting with Socrates um, and throughout the entire 2400 year history of uh, Western philosophy. He wants to turn it on its head, right? And he has a specific kind of uh, criticism. Right, that focuses on metaphors um, and uh, tries to hunt out the underlying disposition uh, behind the theories um, that, that he examines and criticizes. Uh, what Nietzsche wanted to call for was a more natural foundation for knowledge, for human life, um, and for the values that we hold dear and uh, give our lives meaning. So, um, what we find in Nietzsche is sort of a romantic naturalism, right? And uh, the central concept in uh, Nietzsche, you've heard of Superman, right? That's, that's where Superman got his name. Now, <clears throat> now, far from being a red, white, and blue wearing alien uh, who fights for truth, justice, in the American way, uh, Nietzsche's concept of the Superman, or as we now translate it in the, the wake of Clark Kent and Lois Lane, the Overman, was supposed to be um, a human being who is now something more than human. Right? In short, we are supposed to become this super or over human being. Right? Humanity is something that must be overcome. Right? This is partially because Nietzsche theorized in the wake of Darwin, right? And uh, what Nietzsche noticed about our cultures is that, um, well, it's like Darwin, uh, what happens to any species who fails to adapt, who fails to change, who fails to evolve? Well, it dies out, doesn't it? Right? Now, what Nietzsche noticed about our culture is that, for the most part, for the past 2,400 years, it hasn't really changed. So, sure, we've got more technology, and sure, mathematics is more sophisticated, and sure, um, all of that. But, um, for the most part, what we value and the way that we value has essentially stayed the same. So Nietzsche is going to be incredibly critical of that, and um, he holds that, um, well, God is dead. Right? It's our central organizing concept, the, 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 the concept of God, perfect, absolute truth that exists in sort of a heaven of ideas, is dead. We no longer, we no longer buy it. Right? Now, the idea of God is dead, even to an atheist, would seem sort of strange, because if God is dead, God must have first existed. Right? Now, like all concepts, like all truths, like all metaphors for understanding our place in the natural world, Nietzsche sees God as a concept right, that was born at a particular historical point, had a certain kind of usefulness to us, which he now claims as a cultural fact has outlived its usefulness. Right? God is dead. We've slain God. Right? And the tragedy for Nietzsche is not so much that God is dead, right? because concepts outlive their, their usefulness, the Athenian gods, 
outlived their usefulness. Recall that they had a God for everything. God for waking up, God for going to bed, God for the sun coming up, God for the sun going down, um, God for love, God for war, God for etc, etc, etc. If you want the crops to uh, grow properly, if you want to have a romantic interlude, they've got a God for that. Right? And at a particular historical point in time, they stopped believing. These, this notion ceased to have a certain social cachet for um, the ancient Greeks, much the way Nietzsche claims that our concept of God no longer has social cachet for us. Right? So the death of God for Nietzsche is a metaphorical and cultural death. This is not to say that there are no more Christians, it's just that they no longer have the courage of their convictions, and Christianity is something that you do on Sundays. Church is a great place to hand out business cards if you're a real estate agent or a used car dealer. So, um, God is dead. Now, the tragedy for Nietzsche is that we have not gotten beyond this, this death of God, right? What we haven't done is created new values. So what Nietzsche claims is necessary is a revaluation of all values. Most of the things Nietzsche claims that we believe, that we hold dear to our hearts, that we hold up higher as concepts than any of the other concepts, we no longer buy because they're tied to this central notion of perfect absolute truth whether it's the Socratic notion of truth, the Aristotelian notion of truth, Kantian categorical imperatives, what have you. Right? God is dead. And these values that stem from this central presupposition have, to some extent or another, lost their social cachet as well. Right? So what we have to do, according to Nietzsche, is think for ourselves. We have to come up with new values. Right? So for Nietzsche, what he wants to claim is that the value of anything is in the value. Right? Why are diamonds valuable? Because we value them. Why is gold valuable? Because we value it. Why is money valuable? Because we accept that it has value. But none of these things Nietzsche claims are valuable in themselves. We give them that power over us. Right? Now, central to understanding Nietzsche is this idea of the will to power. Right? Now, this is Nietzsche's worldview. Right? We are, in a sense, willing creatures. We're free and we choose and we give value to our lives, we give meaning to our lives through our will. Right? And the reason that any of these values, any of these central concepts have power over us is because they, in a sense, give us power. So, right, this will to power, Nietzsche claims can, well, it's a metaphor, first off, and secondly, it's an anthropomorphic one. But all of the best of our science, all the best of our wisdom, right, works in terms of these metaphors that give meaning to our lives. And the will to power is Nietzsche's central metaphor, and um, he claims that it can be seen in the activity of birds, in the activity of insects, in the activity of any living thing, that it attempts to strive and survive, right, by epitomizing what he calls the will to power. Right? This, is, this is our bread and butter. Right? So taken together, right? whatever doesn't kill us makes us stronger. We are engaged in a natural struggle for survival. Our goal ought be to become something more than we are. Um, we are nothing but this nexus of competing forces, this will to overpower our environment and overpower one another, overpower ourselves, in order to become something more than what we are. The best way that we do this as a culture is through creating values for ourselves, but we haven't done that lately. Right? We haven't done that since this big one, and this big one no longer works for us, so what we need to do is come up with new ones. Take a look at what we value and see if it rings true.